uh, thanks, uh, thanks Hal for the nice introduction. And this is actually a joint work with Hal. And uh, actually, Hal did uh, most of the work for the <laughs> uh, proof. And uh, me, uh, I am only working on this part on the stability condition. So that's uh, why I introduced this part. So if you have uh, further questions about this work, uh, you can either ask me or ask how. Uh, uh, and but I think you can ask me because this is my talk uh, for today. I, okay, so in today's talk, uh, I'm gonna be introducing the stability condition for parahoric Higgs bundle, defining our paper uh, called ten parahoric Higgs bundle for a complex reductive group, and our recent paper on the ten parahoric uh, non abelian hot correspondence. So in today's talk, I'll introduce the beginning of this stability condition. So if you are working on the moduli of sheaves or moduli of vector bundles, you may know a lot of stability condition. And uh, this is a stability condition for moduli of principal bundles, so which may be different. But uh, when you choose G to be the GLN, you are going back to the moduli of vector bundle stability. So that's why we are mostly interested in that. And secondly, I'll talk about what it means to be a parabolic Higgs bundle. So to introduce the parahoric Higgs bundle, you have to first go through the process of parabolic. So this is actually kind of a generalization of the generalization of the classical Higgs bundle for the parahoric case. Uh, and thirdly, we'll talk about our main uh, subject, which is the par 10 parahoric Higgs bundle. So I'll try to include all the introduction for the basic notions and try to include some examples uh, so that you are not get lost. Uh, so hopefully I'll achieve this goals today, okay? Okay, so first of all, let's talk about something about the stability condition, which everyone will be interested in when they are studying the moduli of sheaves problem. So the notion of stability is actually coming from the geometric invariant theory, where you have to consider uh, our construction of modul uh, moduli spaces. Then you have to include the stability defined by Mumford. So in the case of vector bundle, if you want to consider the moduli of vector bundles, you probably already know the following stability conditions. So the first stability is most uh, like naive one, which is called the slope stability. Uh, it's naive just not because it's easy, it's just because we can define the moduli space really uh, quickly after using this stability. And what is a slope a st stability is that you can calculate the mu or the slope of the vector bundle by the following thing, which is the first term class uh, intersecting with a choice of polarization and then a uh, quotient by its rank. So this is called the slope of a vector bundle. And when we only consider uh, our base manifold or base scheme to be a, a curve, then uh, we only uh, need the first term class. So that is where the slope is coming from. Uh, but of course, why it is called a slope, uh, I don't know uh, the idea, but a uh, naive idea is that if you put the rank to be the X coordinate and degree to be the Y coordinate uh, plane, then the slope is exactly the degree over rank. So that's uh, where the name is coming from. And of course, uh, the choice of polarization is also important in many, many cases, but uh, of course, in our case, we are only talking about the curve so that you can see n equals to one, and then we don't actually need a choice of polarization. So that's why uh, curve cases are uh, much easier to study. But uh, in higher dimensional manifolds, you have to consider a choice of polarization, which are leads to many more interesting results like the wall crossing. And that is uh, like, I think the starting point for Bridgeland Stability Commission, which I will not talk about, it will be really interesting to work on if, uh, if you are doing the modular bundle cases. Yeah, so then if you already have the stability condition from the slope, then we can try to generalize them to more decorated bundles, meaning that a bundle that has some structure on it. So first of all, we can generalize it to the sheaves, 
uh, which can include some torsion or some something else like uh, something supported only on zero dimensional like what Yun has already uh, talked about. Uh, it's actually coming from the something like ideal sheet for points. And also we can talk about the principal bundles, which uh, of course they are not vector bundle anymore. And the slope will be defined very differently, which is the, uh, like the whole point of today. And also the Higgs bundle, well, which means that, uh, yeah, any questions? Uh, okay, so for Higgs bundle, you can consider the bundle with some kind of morphism on it. And uh, that's kind of a framing on the bundle. And you can also uh, talk about the stability condition there. So there are many, many more generalization to the same idea. And today we'll be talking about one of the generalization to the parahoric case, okay? Okay, so first of all, let's talk about the most easy case, which is the slope stability condition. And how do you define the slope? Uh, so now everything will be on a non-singular algebraic curve. So sorry if you are working on higher dimensional things because uh, we are only talking about the curve case right now. Uh, and we can define the slope to be a rational number to be the degree over rank. And uh, the stability condition for curve is that uh, vector bundle W is stable if and only if for any proper non-zero sub-bundles V of W, we have mu of V less than mu of W. So where mu is defined to be degree over rank. So this is the very basic definition. And then we would like to generalize that to the G principal bundles. And this is actually done by Ramanathan like uh, 30 or 40 years ago in his 1977 paper, where he talked about the stability condition of principal bundles. And when he said G equals to GLM, we'll recover this uh, stability condition. So let's see what's his generalization and how we come about that. So first of all, uh, we need to consider what it means to be a parabolic subgroup. So choosing a parabolic subgroup is just like choosing a sub subspace. So just uh, in our GLM case, it's just choosing a sub. Uh, sub vector space, if you just look at the vector bundle on a point, then that's the choosing a kind of parabolic subgroup of GLN. So let's consider the easy case of GL4, where you have a four dimensional space or a four, a rank four vector bundle. And then we can talk about the parabolic subgroup. So the formal definition is that a parabolic subgroup is a subgroup between the Borel group G of Borel group B and G. And the Borel group, uh, I won't go over all the group's theoretic definition, but let's see the example right here. So for GL4, the Borel subgroup is exactly the upper triangular matrices, all the upper triangular matrices. And then what are the parabolic subbundles? Well, you can write down the group in terms of the matrices like this. And of course, everything should have determinant A not equal to zero. Uh, so that you make it a subgroup of GL4. And then you can see that all these parabolic subgroups are like choosing a subspace of uh, 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 rank four vector bundle or rank four uh, vector space in the sense that, as you can see here, you are preserving a three-dimensional subspace. Here are a two-dimensional one, here are one-dimensional one. So kind of this is how you think about the so state stability condition in the uh, principal bundle sense, in a sense that choosing a subspace is uh, minorly or like uh, somehow equivalent to choosing a parabolic subgroup. So this is where the stability condition is coming from, in the sense that now we want to choose a subspace or subgroup, parabolic subgroup of a GE principal bundle, what will be happening? So what will be happening is that we can define the stability condition for principal bundles. So let's see the uh, formal definition. And I'll also work on one of the examples for this definition when G equals to GLN. So let's say G will be the same as before. So now I didn't say it, but all of our G are complex reductive group. And 
we uh, set E to be a G principal bundle. And now we consider a parabolic subgroup P of G and we can define a parabolic reduction sigma to be a holomorphic section of E over P. So uh, previously we have, uh, we can see that uh, like for P, uh, a, a subgroup and of G, we can define the flag variety to be G over P. So now here E is a G principal bundle. So in a sense that fiber wise, you have the flag variety and a parabolic reduction is exactly a section of like the fiber uh, flag variety. So uh, still it doesn't really uh, make sense if you are not working too much on this field, but uh, you can just think about it's exactly the same as choosing a sub-bundle of a vector bundle. So uh, in the sense of the G principal bundle, you are just choosing a parabolic reduction as a way of choosing a sub-bundle. So now let's see uh, how do we define the stability condition. So first of all, we have to specify what is called uh, anti-dominant uh, character chi. And uh, this uh, anti-dominant character chi is, uh, is called anti-dominant if the line bundle defined by G times chi C to G over P is ample. So of course, uh, all these kind of things are very formal and doesn't really make sense, but uh, we can talk about a very uh, easy example still about the GL4 case. Okay, so let's see what it means to be uh, like GL4 case. And we consider G equals to GL4 and P to be the matrix group given by our following way. You can see there are three ways of dividing the rank four vector space and we choose the middle way. So we choose uh, rank two inside the rank four. And then each of A, B and C are the two by two matrix. And now we always consider or uh, like a canonical choice to be the uh, determinant of A to be uh, the, the character from P to C star. And we can talk about uh, it's anti-dominant or not. And actually you can prove that it's anti-dominant. And then when we calculate the thing associated to the degree, then you can see that it's two times the degree E of C4 minus four times degree of W. So what is W here? So W here is exactly the rank two sub bundle associated to like the choice of the uh, parabolic reduction. So for every parabolic reduction, you are choosing some kind of section of, uh, yeah, you are choosing a section of the E over P. And then you are, uh, if you, like represented uh, over the C4, you are exactly choosing a uh, rank two subbundle of the EC4 given this representation. So then the degree are exactly given by two times the degree E of C4 minus four times degree of W. So uh, th though this doesn't seem to be very obvious uh, based on the definition I have right here, but in general, it, uh, if you have a flag variety, uh, or a flag of subbundles V1, V2 to VR, uh, where VR is the E of CN. Uh, and the anti-dominant character can be chosen to be uh, uh, a series of number or real numbers satisfying the lambda one less than lambda two less than the two lambda R. Then we can calculate the degree defined to be the following, the lambda n times degree vr plus lambda i minus lambda i plus one of degree of vi. So keep this degree in mind uh, so that we are be able to define or recover the stability condition for the subbundles or the slope stability from this degree. So that is what's called the Ramanathan stability condition. Okay, so here is uh, the real definition or the original definition inside his, his paper uh, uh, called the stable principal bundles on compact Riemann surface. So uh, the definition is that uh, we call a G principal bundle to be R stable if for any parabolic reduction X to E over P, where P is a maximal parabolic subgroup of G 
we have the sigma upper star of t, uh, the tangent space of g over p is greater than zero. So uh, of course, this one is still very abstract, uh, but uh, let's see what it means in terms of our previous example once again, okay? So now we are not talking about the GL4 case. Actually, our previous proof applied to the GLN case. So let's see how does it recover the uh, mu stability condition. So let's consider still the <coughs> parabolic subgroup given by A, B, zero, and C, and where A is an M by M matrix and C is an M minus M by N minus M matrix. And then the character we'll be considering is that determinant A to the power M minus M times determinant C to the power negative M so that it will be acting trivially on the center, which is exactly everything is lambda on the uh, center. So then when you calculate the degree, the degree are exactly given by the M minus M power times the total space degree plus the minus M minus M minus M times the degree of W, where W is the uh, rank M sub-bundle of EV. So back to our, uh, this case right here, you can see that M minus M is two. Uh, so, uh, and uh, M is four. So we have a uh, four uh, times the sub bundle degree and two times the original uh, vector bundle degree. And when you rearrange the inequality, so remember that we need the degree to be greater than zero, then, it's exactly given you the degree of the total bundle over the rank is greater than degree of the sub bundle over the sub bundle rank. So that's how you recover the uh, original slope stability from the Ramanathan stability. Of course, uh, I didn't tell you how this guy is related to the E sigma chi, but uh, that's how the, uh, his original paper talked about the problem right here, okay? Uh, yeah, so any questions before I go through uh, the equivalence? Oh. Okay, so now the, uh, the question is, how does Ramanathan uh, find this stability condition? Well, uh, he finds it just uh, by looking at like the degree of the tangent space. So remember that for any kind of anti-dominant character, we can always associate a line bundle given by like the representation of the character. So if you have a character, then you are always have a line bundle on the uh, E over P by the P bundle right here. So then uh, always you can consider the degree of the line bundle. So that's why, uh, Ramanathan was interested in that because you know we have a very uh, easy way to calculate degree of line bundle, right? Uh, just by using the chen wild theory or something. And also we have uh, the stability condition for vector bundles. So when you apply this, because uh, if you remember the philosophy that choosing a parabolic sub bundle is pretty much choosing the uh, choosing a parabolic subgroup is pretty much choosing a sub bundle, then you can think about how to define the degree of this kind of choice. And to find the degree greater than zero will be giving you back to the uh, original stability condition. So that's the idea behind that. So now uh, how does they relate it to the, uh, the degree of E of sigma chi is that when we choose the chi to be the determinant of the action of P on G over P, then this degree E sigma chi exactly recovers this kind of degree of T of G over P. So that's the uh, going back here. Um, uh, for like, if we have the Ramanathan stability, how do we recover this guy? So this guy is given by any uh, anti-dominant character uh, maximal parabolic subgroup will be a multiple of determinant action. And we know that the determinant action is exactly already telling you some inequality. So then every anti-dominant character 
will be something like uh, given by a multiple of it. So then we uh, can recover the whole thing. So now here is our definition. Uh, also in uh, our paper uh, or motivated by this kind of definition is that we have a, we call the G bundle E to be R stable if and only if for any parabolic reduction and any anti-dominant character that is trivial on the center of P, we have the degree of the E sigma chi is greater than zero, okay? So uh, probably you may ask, why do we need uh, the trivial on the center uh, problem? So why do we need that? Is that the center will provide us something non-zero when you calculate the degree so that uh, it's kind of related to like the intrinsic uh, degree or the topological invariant of the principal bundle. Uh, so if you are working on a semi-simple uh, Lie group, then uh, this doesn't matter because every character will be trivial on the center. But if you are working on a GLN, then there will be something uh, happening if you are doing something that is non-trivial on the center. And that is why we choose this kind of character because uh, that will, this character will be trivial on the center. But let's say if you only choose something like the determinant A, then you'll not be trivial on the center so that they'll give you something wrong after you calculate the degree. So we can remedy this by subtracting the center or quotienting all the center, or we can modify our degree by some uh, kind of pairing. So uh, we, uh, we have all that definition in our paper as well, okay? Okay, so here is how do we actually modify that. So the way we modify that is that we minus the degree by alpha and chi, where alpha is an element in G determined by the topology of our G principal bundles. So uh, this is of course still the principal bundle case. And for the classical bundles, of course, if you are working on the parahoric bundles, then things will be even more complicated. But let's look at the uh, ordinary bundle case. So for ordinary bundle, we can always find an element in G determined by the topology. Actually, in when uh, we are working on GLN, we are getting back to the alpha equals to the degree of E of V over N times the identity. So that's why we can uh, always work on the GLN by uh, by subtracting like the degree of this guy. Okay, uh, so uh, yeah, so let's see uh, what it means to be uh, the parabolic case. So for a parabolic case, all the thing we can define right here is pretty much the same. So uh, let's say we start with a vector bundle and we can determine what it means to be a stable parabolic vector bundle. So uh, of course, as you can see before, parabolic just means choosing a subbundle or choosing a subvector space. So that what it means to be a parabolic vector bundle is that you choose a subvector space or a flag over the point uh, on the vector bundle, and then this filtration, uh, together with the weight of the filtration, will give you something called a parabolic vector bundle. So in uh, every classical case, that's how you generalize to the parabolic case. Uh, so this will be, why do we study that? Because this will be pretty much important when you wanna study the thing like the uh, Riemann-Hilbert correspondence when your uh, Riemann surface have some boundaries or have some a boundary at the points. So then you can, uh, for the vector bundle part, you may uh, need to choose the parabolic bundle instead of the ordinary vector bundles. Okay, so now uh, we still have the same kind of flavor, which is going back to the parabolic degree. So remember that classical bundle has their classical degree and parabolic bundle has 
also their degree defined by degree of the bundle as a classical bundle plus all the same like the parabolic weights right here. So this weights uh, seems to be chosen very randomly, but later you are see that uh, we need to confine them into some of the uh, chambers inside uh, the algebra. But uh, for GLN case, the chamber we'll be choosing will be like this is greater than or equal to zero, less than or equal to uh, less than or equal to one. Why do we choose that? It's just because uh, if you choose that chamber, you can uh, so every arbitrary choice can be like conjugate back to something refined to the chambers. Uh, of course, uh, if you are doing some very wild cases, then it may be not possible, but uh, if you restrict everything to the chamber, then everything will be behaved uh, pretty nicely. So now let's forget about uh, what I said about chambers. So you can still think of everything here as, the, uh, as every real number you can imagine. And now we call the parabolic vector bundle to be stable. If for any parabolic subbundle f prime, we have this parabolic degree over rank less than parabolic degree f over rank. So of course I haven't defined what it means to be parabolic subbundle. So it'll be just a classical subbundle f prime, such that uh, the par uh, the filtration right here will be just f prime intersecting with each of the filtration. Uh, over here. So uh, in a sense that you have to inherit the filtration structure for the original parabolic vector bundles. Okay, so now uh, the thing still we need is to find the counterpart in the parabolic principal bundles. So uh, of course I still have to define the parabolic principal bundles. So here is the confusion. So to choose a subbundle in principal bundle, you have to choose a parabolic subgroup. And now we have a parabolic principal bundle, which means you have to choose another parabolic subgroup. So these two subgroups are not the same. So that's the kind of first confusion right here. So here's the definition. Uh, so uh, for any G principal bundle E and a number of points Xi uh, corresponding to the divisors, we have a parabolic structure of weight alpha i on E over a point xi to be a trace of parabolic subgroup with an anti-dominant character. So now let's see why this one will recover the GLN case. So for GLN, as you can see right here, a choice of a filtration at each p is exactly a flag right here, and the flag will correspond exactly to something like a trace of a matrix like this. So that's a parabolic subgroup. And then how do you find the parabolic weights? So a parabolic weight is a weight uh, alpha one less than uh, two alpha n. And back to our GLN case, well, these are exactly the, uh, the weights associated to the flag. So that will correspond to anti-dominant characters. So all the things will fit together in our previous definition uh, in a sense that we just choose for every point a parabolic subgroup of G. And then uh, to define the stability condition, we have yet to choose another parabolic subgroup. So that is not to be confused with this parabolic subgroup. Uh, so now you can see that the pair of E and the choice of parabolic structure at each of the points it's called the parabolic G principal bundle. So now finally, we have to define what it means to be a parabolic degree. So classically, you can see that the parabolic degree is defined to be something like uh, right here, like the line bundle and uh, given by the anti-dominant character. So now you can see that uh, if we wanna find out the parabolic degree of a parabolic G principal bundle under a parabolic reduction, that's where you should start from. So first of all, for parabolic reduction, you can think about as a degree given by the subbundle, uh, and that is coming from the classical case. And for the second one, which I will not be defined because it's really complicated Lie algebra, it's like, 
you can define the relative degree or the degree coming from the parabolic weight case. So remember that the first part is exactly kind of the subbundle degree, and the second part is coming from the parabolic structure. So that is the definition uh, where it is determined by your parabolic reduction, which is the choice of P. And on each of the points, you have the weights alpha i right there. So that is the parabolic degree. And let's see what it means to be the case of GLN, where we consider the, uh, the decreasing filtration on weight for the alpha i's right there. So you have alpha i r greater than alpha i r minus one and to alpha i of one. And then this is the parabolic structure for each of the points. And you can determine, of course, a flat right here and the weights right here to be alpha i's. And secondly, you know that we, are, we have the parabolic degree, which is determined by the increasing filtration lambda one to lambda s and uh, filtration v1 to vs. So this is another flat of our uh, E of xi. So then you need to combine these two flats and uh, combine all these kind of weights. So the degree, re relative degree is calculated or you can think of it as a definition because I didn't even give you the definition in the case of GLN to be this number. So lambda i minus lambda i plus one and alpha j minus alpha i j minus one of the dimension of the flags intersecting each other. So of course, all these kind of things are pretty much strange in the sense that why do I have to define things like this? So the reason for that it's like, uh, so the Ramanathan stability in this definition will be exactly corresponding to our uh, parabolic degree slope stability condition. So that's why we have to consider this weird definition because let's say we consider the uh, parabolic degree E of sigma chi greater than zero. Then in the case of GLN, we can actually write down the uh, calculation to be like the lambda r of parabolic degree of w minus mu times rank of w. So now w, you can think about it as the still we need to represent our GLM by uh, n-dimensional vector space so that you are recovering a classical parabolic vector bundle. So then you can talk about the classical parabolic degree of vector bundle, and then you, uh, you can uh, reduce the parabolic degree E sigma chi to be this summation. And to say this is greater than zero, you can see, uh, see that everything like uh, in between. So uh, remember that mu is exactly the parabolic degree over rank of degree. So the first term will be zero. And for each of the term over there, you are always recover something like, remember that lambda k is less than lambda k plus one, so that everything right here is negative. So the only thing to make the whole thing positive, if you take like r equals to uh, two, is uh, to make the parabolic degree of uh, the subbundle of a rank of the subbundle less than parabolic degree of the total bundle over the total bundle. So that's how this is uh, proven because uh, you only need a two step parabolic reduction like just like what we did before to recover the definition of the usual uh, slope stability condition, okay? Okay, so any questions before I move to the Higgs bundle? Okay, so now let's see some, uh, something about the Higgs bundle. So for Higgs bundle, uh, if you know it, it's actually a, a curve for a vector bundle and it's a pair E and phi uh, such that phi is a section of the endomorphism of E tensor with the omega x of one. So now uh, you may uh, ask why we need to consider this kind of case. Uh, this is, uh, actually interesting in a sense that 
if you consider the moduli space of Higgs bundle compared to moduli space of the vector bundle, then locally, the Higgs field will give you a deformation of the vector bundle you have right there. So think about the, how do you deform your vector bundle E on the curve X, then you can deform it by adding some kind of uh, thing right here. That is uh, kind, of, kind of the reason behind why we need to define things like this. But uh, now people are more interested in a more general case where you can uh, like get a section of arbitrary stuff like anamorphism E tensor L, where L is uh, deg uh, any degree line bundle, but we are only working on omega x1 in this situation. And of course, the second thing you have to consider is that, which I didn't say about, is that our curve should be having something like g greater than or equal to two. So for genus zero and one, the uh, problem is that you will be having some kind of automorphism of the curve itself, which will actually breaks the vector uh, moduli space and will have some problem for the moduli of vector bundles as well. So that's why we uh, or people won't be happy with all that cases. But of course, there are some many more interesting results on genus zero in a sense that the Higgs bundle right there can be written as a moduli of quiver variety. And for genus one, there are some more interesting results on something related to number theory, if I remember correctly. So, uh, but uh, since we are only working on G greater than or equal to two, then uh, you may uh, not find uh, like things like that in our paper. And the second thing is like, how do we consider a Higgs bundle to be stable? Well, it's pretty much the same as the vector bundle stability in a sense that you have a sub vector bundle F uh, of E and the degree all over rank is less than degree over rank of the total bundle. But now we have a further condition, uh, which means that a sub bundle is preserved by the vector bundle of uh, uh, the Higgs field phi. Namely, we have phi of F is inside F tensor omega X of one. So you can think about vector bundle and since V is a section, it can be sending E to E tensor omega X one. So that for any sub bundle, you can send it to the section as well. And we require that it will be sitting inside F tensor omega X one. So this is the only thing that is uh, more than the vector bundle. But this condition, uh, is giving you some more interesting cases because there are some Higgs bundle such that uh, which are stable such that the underlying vector bundle are not stable. Mm. So uh, that's why I am not saying the Higgs bundle moduli space is a, tan a cotangent of the uh, vector bundle moduli spaces because there are more things contained in Higgs bundle. And now let's consider how, uh, how do you define the Higgs field for principal bundles? Because even the definition requires some kind of thoughts. So one very natural thought is like, if, if you have a principal bundle, you can represent it by uh, represent over some vector field and a uh, vector space. And then you can just like define it by the vector bundle cases. Of course, that's uh, kind of uh, true, but it's not quite canonical in a sense that uh, the, uh, you may have some dependence on the representation. So uh, of course you can say my representation is faithful or something else, some other properties, but I still have to prove it to be like a generic definition. So now the real definition uh, is like, of, um, it's done by Bikar Garcia Prada and I Riara Mundet. Is, uh, is the following. So first of all, we have to define what's called the uh, uh, parabolic, a sheaf of parabolic endomorphism determined by the parabolic structures at the points. So uh, let's unravel this uh, once, one by one. So first of all, for every G principal bundle E, you can think about the adjoint representation of G on its Lie algebra 
uh, that's called also called GE GLA V algebra. And then for every uh, Lie algebra, we can define what's called a parabolic endomorphism. So think about uh, still in our previous case, uh, let's look at the matrix. And then uh, for like, let's say if G is GL4, and for the Lie algebra, you can also think about something like uh, written down in such kind of matrices. And these are part of the thing that are, uh, uh, can be called to be the parabolic uh, endomorphism in the algebra as well. So then uh, this is uh, something like what we have for the endomorphism of E. So remember that when E is a vector bundle, endomorphism of E are exactly given by the n by n matrices, which are like before. So P E of G are just like uh, endomorphism of E outside of the parabolic points and inside the parabolic points, they are exactly given by the matrices determined by the parabolic subgroups. So that are some kind of thing we can define and it's well-defined. So now you don't, uh, we have a very canonical representation, which is the uh, G like the, the algebra. So then if you consider the a section of P of G tensor K of D. So uh, previously for classical Higgs bundle, you have to consider the uh, omega X1, which in the curve case is exactly the canonical uh, bundle K. And then now you have to twist it by D because you have to uh, include the uh, behavior at the points as well. So uh, of course, if you wanna go to higher dimensional cases, then it's K of log D, where you have the logarithmic singularity over the points. So here is where our, our, our work is starting from because we want to go beyond the logarithmic singularity of D and into a more general cases. And uh, now uh, that's why we have to consider what's included in the title called the parahoric bundles. But um, let's talk about that later. And in this situation, let's talk about the G equals to GLN case. So as you can see, for the parabolic Higgs bundle, we have exactly the parabolic structure given by F1 included F2 to Fn. And then what it means to be PEG of KD is exactly telling you that the Higgs field of Fi is inside Fi tensor of KD. So that's the kind of the thing you can derive from our previous definition of parabolic uh, subgroups. And moreover, in the uh, something in, in the paper of Bicar Garcia Prada, I mean that uh, the thing is like the parabolic reduction is not arbitrary. So now, if you want to incorporate the Higgs field in our definition of Ramanasan stability, remember that. Uh, for our reminiscence stability, we have to choose a parabolic reduction. So now it's just like choosing a, a sub-vector bundle of our original vector bundle. So in the case of Higgs bundle, our sub-vector bundle are not chosen to be ar arbitrary sub-vector bundle in a sense that it has to satisfy this preservation by phi. So the preservation is chosen to be something called the sheaf e.g. sigma chi negative. So this guy is also <laughs> determined very uh, complicated, so I won't say the definition right here. But uh, of course, in the GLN case, that exactly tells you that the Higgs field uh, preserve the flag as well. So that's how it is ch chosen. And that's uh, our uh, all the review for the previous work. <laughs> so any questions before I go to the Parahori case? Okay, so uh, for the last uh, 15 minutes, I think I will go over the Parahori case. So probably I won't take too much time, like 15 minutes, only like 10 minutes. So, uh, for the first of all, we have to determine the, what are the parahoric subgroups. So uh, this is actually coming from the parabolic 
as you can see right here, uh, because uh, I didn't tell more about the parabolic, you can think of it as something like uh, choosing a flag over the uh, like the canonical representation. That's kind of the flavor of parabolic. And now the thing we are be looking at is something like uh, called the loop group or uh, in the more algebraic sense, we talk about the group G uh, and uh, we take the field not to be a complex number, but to be the uh, something like the Laurent series uh, or the something like the Taylor series formal group. So in this situation, we want to talk about the G of K, uh, where K is the Laurent series uh, formal, uh, formal field. And then, uh, of course, if you are number series working on p-adic fields, you can also take K to be the p-adic field. Uh, actually, all the things are very uh, studied uh, broadly by the number series because they have many, many interesting applications to the, like the Riemann hypothesis. But uh, we are working from a different aspect, working only on the case of C of double bracket C. But uh, I think uh, our work will also work on the periodic field as well, because we didn't actually use too much property of this field right here. So now the thing is like, uh, of course, you can still talk about, let's uh, say for this field, you can have a vector space of K, and then you can talk about the flag. But are there more things that behave like the parabolic case uh, in general? Well, there are, and there are many different definitions of that, uh, which is called the, um, the parahoric subgroup. So the parahoric domain is coming from two parts. So the parabolic part, which is our classical case uh, for G is just a complex reductive and Iwahori subgroup, which is an uh, algebraic group studied by Iwahori uh, when he wanna uh, study something like the Borel subgroup corresponding to the case where G is such kind of very complicated field. So now uh, in this case, uh, remember that previously we have to choose a parabolic weight to be all that numbers. And actually that numbers are chosen inside uh, the Y of T tensor with Q. Of course, uh, I didn't tell you what are the Ys. So the Ys should be some kind of the the algebra associated to the uh, associated to the original G right there, which I will not be specifying what they are. And then we can define, of course, see a very complicated definition, but I'll still give you an example later on, the parabolic parahoric subgroup to be the following case, which is like the T of A and something given by UR of Z to the power MR of theta A, and where R is inside uh, some kind of roots inside uh, the, the, G, um, the G right here. So now, uh, of course, let's see the real example because the definition is still very uh, non-intuitive. So let's consider the case back to C of double bracket Z. And now we have the integer ring of this, uh, field to be the uh, Taylor series. Uh, and then the prime ideal we talk about will be consider the thing generated by just the Z right here so that the residue field is exactly going back to our K. So then we are need to consider the parahoric subgroup of GL3K. So what you can calculate is that the parahoric subgroup will be conjugate to the following, which are the following three cases that correspond exactly to something like what we see before. Uh, so this is like, so now the difference is like in parahoric case, we are the total thing will not be uh, GL3 of K, but be GL3 of O for every parahoric subgroup. So uh, everything inside GL3 of O or something that are inside P uh, over here and something inside P over here. So these are the three uh, parahoric subgroup we can talk about. 
And remember what we have uh, in the beginning, like the choosing uh, something like uh, the, uh, the flag over here, right? So this is also like choosing a flag over O to the power of three, but now you are allowed to choose the total flag. So that is the main difference. And moreover, if we set something like uh, Z equals to zero, uh, remember that O is all the Taylor series, meaning that there's no Z to the minus one power over there, that so you can set Z equals to zero. And then this will exactly recover the parabolic subgroup of GL3 of K by these two guys. So this is uh, really kind of why it is a generalization of the classical case uh, where you have the uh, like setting z equals to zero. And moreover, if you are considering uh, a simply connected uh, a reductive group, then you can have more uh, fun calculations of all the things like GL3 of the of G of K, and then well, going back to the classical parabolic subgroup as well, if you go to z equals to zero. So when uh, G is not sim simply connected like PGL, then there will be some problem, uh, but uh, you can, uh, so actually there are uh, some a very subtle issue right there. Uh, I won't be talking about, but uh, it's really confusing because uh, uh, it's kind of like maximal compact or maximal bounded subgroups are not the parahoric subgroups in this situation. So for uh, the case where Z, uh, for the not uh, simply connected case, then everything will be working very smoothly. Uh, at least for GLN, it's also working very well. So back to our definition right here, you can see it's still very complicated, but you can have some real calculation on it on some very simple cases. So for uh, many more cases like SO or SP, uh, I don't know how to calculate that, but there's already a very general theory on it uh, for all these kind of issues right there. And of course, uh, if you have a parahoric subgroup, now the thing will be pretty much the same because you know that parabolic corresponds to choosing a, a sub-bundle. So parahoric subgroup of choosing uh, also correspond to choosing a subbundle for parahoric uh, like torsors right there. So now you can define the corresponding group scheme over D and you can actually talk about the group scheme that is G uh, over something that is not the point. And well, over the point, you'll be having exactly the parabolic parahoric subgroups. So that is the thing or the general thing we'll be talking about. And of course, we'll be talking about the parahoric reductions because as you know, you need to define the stability condition by the parahoric subgroup. So now the parahoric reduction will pretty much be the same, but now you have to satisfy a, a community diagram right here so that you make it well-defined so that we can also use the degree of this line bundle given by the parahoric reduction to define our degree just like before. And finally, let's talk about the parahoric degree stability condition. Is that for every parahoric degree G theta torsor, we can uh, find, uh, find a reduction and then define the parahoric degree. And now here, the first part corresponds, as you know, to the sub-bundle cases. And the sec second part corresponds to a parabolic weight, but in this sense, it's a parahoric weight. So we can write down this kind of thing more explicitly in the parahoric case, which is kind of interesting because in parabolic case, it's yeah. even more complicated than this case. And now the R stability condition is that for any proper parabolic subgroup and any reduction of structure proof, of E over P theta and any anti-dominant character that is trivial on the center. So when you have all these three conditions, parahoric weight is greater than zero. So just like what we had before, we'll be having something like the sub-bundle case and uh, a contribution from the parahoric weights. So why it is important is that we have tried to calculate or 
equivalence, uh, the equivalence of category, uh, the equivalence is mainly done by Hao uh, in uh, this paper. And we have the following equivalence, which means that the C the bold modulized spaces, which correspond to the R stable 10 parahoric. I didn't tell you what it means to be 10, but uh, you can just think of it as a way, a uh, good uh, classes of parahoric because not very general par parahoric can be written down uh, very explicitly. So we can only talk about the 10 cases. And uh, you can think of it as, as in our par parabolic cases confined in like uh, zero and one, but for parahoric, it can be even more general than that. And of degree zero on X and the residue field of Higgs bundles uh, are, uh, has de uh, degree zero residue at the punctures. And the, for the second uh, correspondence will correspond to the equivalence classes of the R stable 10 logohoric D modules. And the third thing is corresponding to the equivalence classes of the G local systems. So everything will be fitting together in this picture when you consider the previous uh, very uh, general definition of the uh, parahoric degree. And of course, the proof is not, uh, it's really too long to be included here. So I'll just stop here. So thanks for coming. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, yeah, l uh, yeah, th thanks for the talk. Uh, so, any question for the speaker and also for the talk? Yeah, if you have any question, you can unmute by yourself or uh, type it in the chat. Team. Okay, yeah, if there is no question, yeah, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> and uh, uh, thanks. Yeah.